All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first uh, virtual uh, Southeast Tennessee Resource Conservation and Development Council's uh, virtual meetings uh, that we're going to be having this year. We're going to be having once one every month. Uh, so be sure to check out our Facebook page to see the upcoming uh, events that will be happening in the next few months. Uh, my name is Seth Schaefer. I am the Executive Director for the Southeast Tennessee Resource Conservation and Development Council. Uh, joining me today is uh, Mr. Tom Stebbins. He is the UT uh, Extension Agent for Hamilton County. Uh, and he has uh, prepared a presentation uh, dealing with uh, integrated pest management uh, on farms and gardens. So, uh, Tom, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Seth. I appreciate you. And uh, I, uh, I've i always had a pleasure of speaking to your students at Southern Adventist. So um, this is very similar. And, and basically what this uh, presentation is about are the tricky ways or the, I guess, the stumbling blocks you may have of controlling pests in your garden or in the field. Basically, it's I think it's suited for gardeners. So we'll, we'll see a lot of um, diseases and some insects, I think, about um, some of the challenges you have in doing organic pest control. Okay. Anyway, this little cartoon says, uh, <laughs> says uh, so Jack, did you use compost or chemical fertilizers? A lot of people are asking that question these days and, and rightly so. It, it's always good to ask your supplier or your farm marketer, you know, what they're, what they're putting on your produce. And um, here's another one that says, not authentic, organic, and local again, as the cavemen have a choice of what they're gonna have. We have a little bit of a choice. Um, I did a little research when I put together this program. And uh, when I, I guess this might've got me started in, in my, my uh, becoming a county agent or be, at least getting into horticulture back in the day. And this is done in, back in 1959. I think that was an organic farming magazine. This is the Rodale magazine. Here's the more up-to-date version. Probably, I'm not sure if, the, I, I'm, I guess I should check and see. I don't think I've seen this at the newsstand, but I'd be surprised. Oh, I think they sold it to, um, to a major garden or a magazine editor. It might still be called Organic Garden. But anyway, it was just full of articles about how to raise blueberries, how to raise different crops. Every, every month was different. I always look forward to getting this thing. And so this is this is kind of a segue to, to you and where do you get your information from? So this was J.I. J. Rodell. He coined that term organic farming back in 1940. And that's not that long ago, really. So if you think about it, it it's really uh, a relatively new term. And of course, it's really exploded over the years. And we've gotten you know, quite a bit of information on organic gardening these days. And that was his picture. Back in 2002, right around that time, there was, uh, before that time, there was a lot of, there wasn't that many standards for growing something organically, but the United States Department of Agriculture got together with the certified growers. There were a lot of these already in the states and they came up with the organic standards, national organic standards. So um, they don't determine the products. It's sort of a committee. And so they come up with the allowable things in organic production. So I, don't, I think it's still not a law but it's a very strict guidelines of what you can, can or cannot use. And sometimes the standards, the state standards can be tougher. Here's the way we um, define integrated pest management. And you can do it a lot of different ways. Basically it's, it's using all kinds of different tactics to control pests. And if you look down at the bottom, the bigger, fatter part is what we all should be doing is the cultural site selection, having good sanitation, pick the right varieties, rotations. Um, maybe if you go on up a little bit, the physical weeding, hand, hand weeding, mulches, pruning, different things like that. And as you go way up to the top, if you look at the very tippy top, you'll see that's where you might use 
well, that would be maybe the conventional. If we're, if we're thinking about IPM, and we'd probably have to cut that part off if we're thinking about organics. So you can see that um, even in a non-organic system, we try to make sure that that's gonna be the, the last effort, the last ditch effort to do that. You come down and certainly we'll talk a little bit about some of the other organically approved um, materials. The first thing I wanna talk about is abiotic, which means non-living causes of plant problems. And these are quite a few, water, temperature, site problems, nutritional, high soluble salts, pH, pesticide improper application. So these are the things that can lead to plant diseases, but generally they're not the fungus and bacteria and viruses that we think of as plant diseases. And the way I like to think about it is, you know, these, these circles. I was taught this in graduate school way back in a long time ago. And I thought for a lot of you visual learners, this is a good way to look at it. You've got the plant, you can think of that as the plant. You can think of it, every plant is in some kind of environment. It may be there's wind or rain or hail or pH or temperature and, and many, many other things. But if you're talking about plant diseases, you throw in another ring, which is the pest. And that pest could, we could talk about that being diseases or insects. And then we put those guys, those different rings together. And here's the pest. And then if you've got those combined, you've got the pest severity. So by looking at this right away, you can say, well, if I pulled on one of those rings, it would make the red part smaller. And that's the, that's really the key to integrated pest management. You do everything in your power to kind of reduce the severity. You may not make it go away. One way to make it go away is to just not, not choose to grow that plant. And I know I've heard from a lot of organic growers that maybe squash is just something that they can't do because it's, it's quite a few challenging pests in squash. So that may be the case. Maybe you've got the perfect site for it good air flow and everything where you can add that to your, um, your, uh, your cornucopia of crops. But anyway, if you think about this, I always think of this as how did, when I tell my um, growers, I say, this is the way to figure out what the problem is. And this is also the way to figure out how to solve the problem. So you could, you could plug in anything in here. Let's look at, look at it a little bit differently here. Here's the triangle again, and all these different things you can do to break down those rings, or also what you could say is you could kick down one of those sides of the triangle and do the same thing as pulling out a ring. So you could either use resistant varieties, you could have, you know, or don't crow that crop. You could plow under the residue. There's just a lot of things. And most of these are organically uh, bent type things you can do. Um, certified seed. Yeah, most of these things are things you could even use in any kind of systems. Now, here's, here's um, I'll, I'll throw in a, right away, a hard one. An air, this is air drainage. Here's a problem that can occur on squash. Uh, in one case, it's called wet rot, called whisker rot. And you can see that 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 was probably laying on the ground. It was probably a wet conditions. And that's gonna be a very hard one to control. Probably one of the ways to control that would be to, well, it says on there, avoid tree line fields because most of the time fungi like wetness periods. Um, I did my master's way back in the day on apple scab, which is a, which is a fungus that gets on apples. And we, we did something back there they had just starting to do computer modeling. And so my job was to put uh, apple seedlings out and then I would count the number of spores and, and it would depend on how much wetness there was in the, on the leaves. So we had a leaf wetness meter back then. And nowadays, a lot of that information is being used for farmers. Farmers who are really in the know about things can have a, an alarm uh, to some of those tools in the field and it would tell them what, when the conditions were right for certain diseases 
and maybe they would have to go out and do some kind of a spray or some kind of a, you know, uh, you know, they would know that they were going to have a, a wetness period that would be conducive to a fungal disease. Water is very important in situations. Uh, you want to use an efficient method of irrigation, drip, soaker is a good way. Try to keep your wet foliage down as much as possible because that causes disease problems. It causes wetness sometimes, can burn the plants if it's in a sunny area. Splashing, uh, rainwater can splash the disease that might be harboring in the soil. And, um, and sometimes the water itself can cause problems. So you, you wanna have good clean water that doesn't have any uh, contaminants that may, um, may cause a problem. Here's the biotic. These are the living pests of plants that we'll touch a little bit here. Um, of course, weeds, insects, nematodes, fungi, bacteria, and viruses are, are the ones that we normally think about the most. Here's a plant that I can't tell you what type of plant this is. It's just sort of a, a diagram of all the plants. Let's say it's a maple tree. Let's say it's a tomato. Let's say it's an apple tree. So what we're trying to show here is that every plant has uh, a combination or a bunch of diseases. And so this would be a, one very sick plant. Although you, if you pick tomatoes, for instance, which maybe most of you are growing, a tomato could have as many as 10, 20 different diseases. Chances are you're only gonna see one or two every year, but that can sometimes shift, depends, depends on the, the temperature, the wetness, and the growing conditions. So your one farmer may have some different problems than another farmer. So, and, and the way to name diseases are often just the way it looks. I've had really good luck. And I tell, again, I tell either master gardeners or growers that if, you're, if you want more information, look at your plant and if it's drooping, for instance, the top of this plant has a wilt. So if you just say tomato wilt and you look it up on Google, on the internet, chances are you're gonna get something, especially if you pick a site that's from Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina in our area, you're gonna get something that's gonna talk about tomato wilt. You don't have to know the fancy, fancy uh, Latin names and things like that. So, uh, same thing for a leaf spot, you know, you can say, uh, you can say pepper leaf spot or pepper fruit spot, things like that. Or if you pull up a plant and see some galls, you can just say gall. So chances are it'll take you to a website that'll um, have a, a, some choices that you can make. And then you can cue in on it a little bit closer to see what, what the problem is. And this is the key in figuring out first of what the problem is that you have. And of course, if you really need to, you can take a sample, you can take a picture nowadays and send it off to, to me as a county agent. And I can turn around and send that to the lab in Nashville. And uh, sometimes you can get the answer back pretty quick that way. Then I can, then the answer comes directly back to you. Unfortunately, they don't have that, that online system for everybody, growers yet. But if you wanted to, you could send it a sample, but sometimes that takes a little longer. I would, I would suggest the sample if you really have a serious problem, especially if it's been something that you've been fighting for um, a year or two. But uh, a lot of times we can, we can uh, solve the problem just by a, with a really good set of pictures. Don't just do one, do, do several. Then um, here's insects, the same, the same thing for insects. The insects can be, can chew, have sucking galls, internal. They can cause disease. They can lay eggs. A lot of them can be grubs underneath the ground. So basically this is just a picture of all the things that can go wrong with plants. And this is, uh, I put this in there in, in a couple of times, I think I haven't done it for quite a while, but I used to dress up as Sherlock Holmes and give this presentation. And I would have, I would challenge you to identify different people in your community that can help you. You're the, you're the, the detective, but in order to get, um, get questions and answered, sometimes you have to go and find who can give you, you know, present the evidence. 
So you may know all the answers to it because if you're growing the same thing, but a lot of times you need to, well, for one thing, you probably need to pay attention to the weather because you got to know what the weather was in the last week or two and probably what the weather is going to be in the next week or two to be a good detective. And, uh, and you might also need to figure out where there was, where your plants came from, what was the source. So if you're not, if you're not the exact grower, if you're just trying to diagnose someone else's problem, you have to kind of ask those questions. Who, who planted it? What kind of seeds? Where was it planted? What was the weather? Things like that. So this is just the microscopic world of the fungus. And you can see how powerful a fungus is. We, we certainly are reading articles about the viruses, but these are fungal structures. They're, they're still small. If you, if you want to think what a virus size is, take just one of those little threads or those spores coming out of those containers and you could probably get a million uh, virus particles on one of those little thread-like things. So that's how small viruses are. Bacteria are quite small too. They're somewhat in between a fungus and a virus. But here's the fungal spores and you can see when, when they get wet, a lot of times that little cup that they're in expands and the wind takes them away and puts them on other plants. And if the plants stay wet for a period of time, that's why you should try to use drip irrigation or bottom uh, irrigation, because if you have it, have it over the top, your plants stay wet and these spores can land and they're basically like little tiny seeds. If, they, if it stays wet long enough, they'll put down a peg a little root, or they don't call it a root, they call it more of a peg, will come out of that little seed and go right into the plant. And then, then it will cause this a disease like this. It'll penetrate, get into the tissue, and uh, then you've got a really bad thing. A lot of times those spores harbor in the soil, for instance, these damping off diseases, Fusarium root rot is a nasty one. And if that fungus, um, it, it can infect a, uh, one crop, but then those spores will stay in the ground for a long, long period of time. And so sometimes the only way to get around this is to pick resistant varieties of plants. Here's a whole series of plants called anthracnose. And we, if you ever did any history, you know that there, there used to be an anthrax of cattle. And so I think the term goes back to that. And so you can see all these different ones, bean, strawberry, tomato. The, the take home message here is that they're all called kind of that anthracnose, but I'm not telling you, and in, in fact, it's not even true that the bean anthracnose infects the strawberries. They're all separate. They're all separate, but they're all called anthrax, anthracnose. And I think it's because they're a little bit worse than spots. You know, their leaf spots are more definitive and, um, these are a little bit, a little bit more uh, non-discrete. So here's a couple of the ideas here. Um, it says, organic growers beware. Sometimes the control options are very, very limited in a in a um, organic setting. Crop rotation may help with uh, some of these resistant varieties. Strawberries, no overhead irrigation on some of these types of problems. We have to think about insects. Here's, it's, here's a diagram of a aphid. Aphid is a tiny little green, kind of a sweet looking little insect. I think they look sweet, but they, cause, they can cause some problems. They have the mouth part you see that can stab into a plant and pull out juices. And that's bad enough but sometimes they can also go from plant to plant. They can go from a weed that might be outside your bean crop and that bean may have viruses inside the sap. And so here's an aphid that can suck the juices from one and inject while they're getting some more sap from another plant, they're going to, uh, the virus could be transmitted that way. So insects are often virus vectors. So you want to think about controlling other pests too. There's a corn rootworm right there. 
think there's an aphid picture. And, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about some viruses down the road here. Now yeah, here's some viruses. Mosaic virus is caused by aphids. There's an, another virus that's caused by a little other type of insect called a thrips. And uh, then another one's caused by squash bugs and then beetles. If you've been growing curcurbits, that's another challenge with beetles. The beetles scratch on the, the, the plant and inject a, a bacteria into the plant. Here's what the tomato spotted wilt virus would look like if, it, if you had tomatoes. Often this starts in the greenhouse on transplants because the thrips are usually, some of the thrips or most of them are tropical type insects. Not all of them, but a lot of them get started from maybe you buy your plants from a uh, southern source and uh, they get, it gets going in the greenhouse. And the next thing you know, you start planting them out in the field. And generally you'll just see one or two of these scattered in the field on the plants. And there's symptoms too, to look at the plant to see that. Basically it, it kind of stops up the vascular system of the plant. And the next thing you know, it's, um, it's shutting down. Here's what it looks like on the plant and then some of it looking on the crop. Again, it's insect vectored. Here's some of the general croppings. You wanna think of uh, management in the different categories here. Like if you're gonna use sprays, either organic or regular, it's nice to know that you can probably use the same sprays or control measures on the same family of crops. You've got cucurbits have all those, brassica have all those, and there's, there's several. And this is good too to know when you're rotating. If you're rotating vegetables, if you rotate between these groups, often you'll get away from some of those pests. So that's a good way to solve some of those problems. And usually you see sweet corn is by itself. So that's usually a good rotation. Beans are also a good rotation with some of those other cucurbits and things. And here's a typical, maybe a little drawing that you should do. And if, if you've got a big enough area to have a four year rotation, I don't know if you have to have a four year, but you can have at least a rotation and just move it around. Cause some of these, some of these insects and diseases can travel a little bit further than just have them in the same field. And some of those diseases can actually travel a half a mile. So what you're trying to do is just dim, dim the light, make it a little less likely that, that it'll spread from field to field. Some of those diseases are soil borne. So this certainly helps. So crop rotation, when does it work best? Um, it works best against pathogens that are soil borne. So they're kind of stuck there. So if you move around your plants, you get away from that. Some of them that have a narrow host range so they can't find something else to eat. And maybe they're short lived so they can't wait you out. <laughs> so that's where your crop rotation might come into play there. So here's one that is a downy mildew. It's a fungus. It's one that will not work very good with crop rotation because when I remember when I showed you that picture of the spores, this is the same thing that if you can look at just one of those little lesions, brown lesions on there, there would be thousands of spores and those spores would be in, get in the wind very easily and drift and get wherever it could get from one place to another. Cultural control, first of all, you wanna buy seed from a reputable source, avoid pathogens by looking over your, maybe inspecting your transplants or your plants prior to purchase or if you're growing them in a greenhouse, make sure you inspect them beforehand. Maybe you can pick out that nasty uh, tomato spotted wilt uh, tomato. So your inspection, control alternate hosts, um, that, that can happen in some fruit growers do that with, um, with some of the rust diseases. And use non-contaminated water. Sometimes what that means is often we might have a farm pond that we draw irrigation water out of. And not all the time, but during some parts of the summer, 
that water can get contaminated with some of the fungal diseases that we were talking about here. So there's often ways to clean that water up. It can be expensive to do that, but um, you wanna try to find a, a good clean water source. Here's um, some of the uh, plants that uh, were recently obtained, or let's say commonly obtained from chain stores and garden centers. So all the, often they're getting their plants in uh, from different places. Sometimes they pack them in too tight and some of these diseases get going, like that bacterial spot of tomato or pepper gets going. And then when you buy it, if you buy that just for your garden, then you can spread that pretty easily because they've already started for you. Here's some more of the cultural control methods. Make sure you have clean tools. And when we say disinfect, disinfest, means basically just clean them. You know, if you brush off or clean off, wash with soap and good water, you don't have to use chlorine bleach unless you're really, or something else that's um, organic, um, got organic uh, certification. But if you really have a problem, sometimes tomato growers who are doing it on a big scale, they basically can't even use the same pots over and over because that's, that's a no-no because some of those bacteria live on the pots. I know in the past I've worked with some growers that thought they could just clean their pots real good with bleach or whatever, and then start over again, save a little money. But, uh, but that doesn't work. You really need to have clean, clean materials. Uh, pasteurized soil, we don't do that too often anymore. We've got already made pasteurized soil. Usually if we're using a greenhouse, it's hard to, and that's what they're talking about there in a potting mix. So there's compost. Some of the compost are, are shown to be suppressive to diseases. And that means that they're just, um, they're gonna keep the bad guys. You know, when you look at, when you look at a compost pile, you, you see all kinds of worms and creatures in there. And you can imagine that there's more things in there that, that we know of. I think that if somebody said there's a million organisms in a handful of soil, I don't know how many there would be in a handful of compost, but the take home message is that 99.9% .9 of those things are good, good, healthy things for your garden. It's just that very small, less than 1% that you have to worry about. So most of the time the compost is gonna be on your side and it's gonna work against those diseases. So a good compost has a lot of those a lot of those little um, beneficial organisms in there. So remove disease plants and remove bad plant parts. Sometimes you can get away just by nipping off places where disease or, or is starting. Here's some more things that you can do. Maintain good air circulation. And this goes with, if you're starting your plants, space the pots out. No pets allowed because lots of times pets Cats, for instance, can walk on. I've seen cats go through nursery greenhouses and they're going from plant to plant. Probably not a problem unless you do have a disease already going in there, but they'll carry it around. Avoid the late afternoon irrigation. Keep those leaves dry as possible with trickle. Uh, rotate, clean the stock. If you're wrestling, especially if you're using some of your stock for propagation, make sure those propagation materials are the cleanest what you have. Because often if, if they're not, you can propagate your material and that's a way to really easily start over or start your disease going. Sometimes you can clean containers, which is a good idea. Just if you're, um, if you think you can, if it's not a real problem, if you don't have a real serious problem, you might be able to get away with cleaning some of your pots and trays with bleach. Controlling insects with uh, things like sticky traps. There's there's little tr uh, sticky traps that you can put in a, um, a hoop house or a greenhouse that'll that they'll get caught in. Some of them are attracted to it. You know, they might be yellow, might be blue. And sometimes those cr creatures like white flies or things will actually seek out. So you can get just sh sheer numbers. You can do that. Now, if you're getting a little bit fancier, you can get into uh, 
more weather monitoring, but most of us can do a rain gauge. That's that's pretty good. Rain gauge is is really valuable because it, it tells you how much rain you got, even though the weatherman said you got an inch, you might have only got a tenth. And that means you have to turn on the irrigation. Or the weatherman said that there was a tenth and you really got a, a an inch. So that means you don't have to use the irrigation. So there's a lot of little characteristics there that you can use to control the problems in your particular site. Orientation of rows, sometimes people say north and south, but I don't know. I think it depends on how the rolling of the hill is going. The basic idea there is just to maximize the sunlight, maximize how the wind flows through your uh, area. And you may be the best um, observation of that. Of course, density always, uh, get that just perfect density so that you can you can maximize the number of plants in your in your area but you don't want to um, make them too tight to cause diseases and we already talked about irrigation and staking and trellising can be a real good thing if you can uh, match the time it does to do that versus staking your crops can be very beneficial to uh, to get them getting them off the ground Here's, uh, everyone usually laughs at this little one. I don't know where I got this from a seed catalog, I guess. But it does show, it does bring home the idea that there are, there are quite a few things out there as far as disease resistance. It doesn't always go down to the cultivars or the, or the varieties that people like, but often it does. So if you're looking in catalogs, you may want to pick varieties. Here's one that strawberries, for instance, uh, pelican doesn't seem to be getting that anthracnose disease where channeler is very susceptible. So you want to pick um, ones, you might have to tell people that, hey, you know, these are strawberries and <laughs> maybe the taste isn't that much different. Sometimes people get caught in certain, certain ones and they're hard to do. So what diseases should you try? These are hard to control diseases that need resistance. There's black rot on cabbage. There's the viruses in beans. And there's the fusarium wilt. It was a nasty disease. Probably you've heard of fusarium maybe and one other one called verticillium. It gets in the vascular system. So really there's no topical spray of any kind you can use. So the best way over the years, they've developed cultivars for some things, not everything. They've got some really good ones for tomato and pepper and and that sort of thing. Here's um, early blight. Let's take tomato, crop rotation, cleanup debris, staking helps, resistant varieties, there's a few. It overwinters in the soil, but mulching has little effect. Incoming air currents is a major source. So that's, you know, it's hard to grow tomatoes and try to space them out because they tend to grow and fill up spaces that they have. But there you can see that the stakes are, are there. I've been told too that you gotta be careful. Sometimes those wooden stakes, if you use them over and over again are good places for harboring the next year's um, quantity of, you know, usually the fungus that'll cause it. This is, this is a fungus. So here's um, the air, movement of air currents. Some of the biological controls that we're looking at for insect pests, these are, are getting to be more and more popular. And basically the idea here is to plant some other crop that may or may not be a production crop, but in this case, you might have it, uh, cilantro and dill. They have, these tiny little flowers seem to attract a lot of the beneficial insects that will go and find some of your same pests, especially insect pests, on other crops. So by putting these in between rows or around the perimeter, you can often have your own built-in biological control mechanisms. So here's some of the ones to look for. This is the lady beetle larvae. And you can see the adult bottom right chowing down. But I've watched some of the larvae chow down even more. The larvae is up above there. And I think they're more voracious eaters of those aphids than, than even the adults. 
So here's um, their ground covers may harbor spiders and ground beetles. And again, most of these insects are beneficial. If you see some beetle, try to identify it, make sure you know what's walking through your garden, make sure it's a, it's a, a if it's a pest, then maybe you need to, need to do some control measures, but quite often it's a um, beneficial. Here's another example. I've got several slides of some of these beautiful insects that are just so great for your garden. Tiger beetles, crane mantis. These usually come quite late in the season and maybe a little bit too late, but, um, but they are very beneficial. They're not always native pests either. There's the Chinese one, Carolina, I guess it's a more native. Lace wings are very beneficial. They go after aphids and mealybugs and scale and all this stuff. Ground beetles, just because there's beetles going through your garden, they could be just be going for caterpillar snails and slugs. This one is really beneficial, soldier beetles. They fly through, they, they like to get on um, pollen, looking for pollen, but in, all, along the way, they're chowing down on beetle larvae and other insects. Again, here's some examples of good beneficials, wild carrots. I guess that's Queen Anne's lace in the, in the, in the um, yeah, in that family. There's mints, buckwheat. Some of those ones are, are cover crops too that help um, support wildlife. Parasitic wasps, people cringe when they think of wasps, but these are so tiny, you probably can't even see them. And what they do is they, they sting some of those eggs of the pests and then they suck out the juices of leaf miners, caterpillars. And again, you probably won't even see them and they won't even sting you. They're, they can't sting you basically. Um, and they're, they're basically called solitary. They don't have a nest like we think of uh, um, yellow jackets or things like that. So these are very beneficial. They're, they're, they were built, you know, they're almost prehistoric creatures that go after all these um, all these things in the garden. Some of these are ones that you probably, yeah, some of these you wanna be careful. Even, even the ones that would sting you are beneficial, but you may have to do some control to make sure you don't, you know, put them in, put anybody in jeopardy, yourself or, or other people. The one on the right there is a crane fly. You might, you see those bobbing around in your house, you might think that's a big mosquito, but that's a crane fly. Spiders are very beneficial in a, any garden situation. They're trapping insects and they're, they're just a real good, the only two you really wanna worry about is brown ocluse and, and black widow, but they're, they're almost never in a garden situation. Here's, uh, if you wanna grow your plants, the best way possible with high quality seed, vigorous, um, get it growing real well. That'll that'll make it much less likely that you'll get uh, problems in your garden related to insects or diseases. Maintain your quality, you know, do your soil testing, optimal nutrition, all these things lead to fewer pests. This is all good, a part of a good pest management system. Minimize bare soil, that's where cover cropping comes in. Make a tight situation so you don't get weeds. It says that buckwheat is an excellent. There's clovers and different ones that work out real well. Sometimes rotating between different cover crops is a good idea. Because what they're doing is they're trying to reduce that seed bank. Boy, if you get into yellow nut sedge or some of those, some of those nasty weeds can really cause problems in your gardens. So anyway, here we're getting to, uh, you know, sometimes we have to really be careful about sprays. And there are some sprays that, that the National Organic Product List, and if you look over this list, you might have used some of these, coppers and limes, they're considered nat uh, natural type things. When you go down the line, the oils can be considered organic. They, 
I guess they have to be certified or they have to be under, on that list to be, not all, all oils are in that category. Same thing if you go down to the streptomycin and the tetracycline, these antibiotics are generally, or not generally, but often they're um, approved, but sometimes we don't uh, suggest them for instance, because some of those same things we use for our sore throats and things. So we wanna really be careful if we're going after some of the diseases that we're not overusing them. Because the idea from some people, the theory anyway, is that if they're overused in agriculture, they might not work as well in human uh, pathology. Here's one that shows bacterial leaf spot. Um, not sprayed and use a copper spray. So it works pretty good on spots in some cases. Here's one powdery mildew. It works pretty good on powdery mildew, sulfur. Again, you wanna combine a good cultivar that you know that is really hardy. I don't know if there's any resistance. There probably is some resistance on some of the cultivars to powdery mildew. That's a pretty common one with resistance. Here's bean rust has resistant varieties and sulfur could be used. When you're disinfecting your pots and greenhouses, you can sometimes use chlorine materials, but there's other things too that are specifically made, copper sulfate, hydrogen peroxide. That's, uh, there's an acid, parasitic acid for tools. I don't know if anybody uses ozone, but that might, could be used. Then there's biologicals. These are out there. They could be used. I, I guess I don't have a real good handle. I know what some of them do and some of them are, are known to be pretty good. So I would, I would um, use them if you've got, they're mostly for soil borne diseases. And the idea is that you spray this on your plants and basically it gives, it takes over the, the spot where the diseases would uh, would normally attach. So they're like, for instance, the root shield, it shields the roots from uh, the bad guy. The good guys get on there before the bad guys get on there. That's basically the way it works. And there's, there's several companies that are out there trying to uh, produce these things. Of course, we've heard of neem oil. There's different product names. They're used to control mites. Some organic growers have reported very good um, success with those. Others say not so much, but they might just turn the teeter-totter just a little bit. That may, may all, be all you need just to turn the tide a little bit. Same thing with all the other oils like cinnamon oil, clove oil. And then there's some of the petroleum oils, rosemary mint. So there's a whole whole kaleidoscope of these things. I don't know if there's any a one-stop shop for all these things. I think I think some of the universities publish some of these and give you some idea. There's uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is known for a lot of things. There's different subspecies that one Israeli Israeliensis is known for mosquitoes or in this case gnats. There's one for Gosh, there's one for the caterpillars I know in the garden that people use, but there's others that are used for different larvae. There's a spinosad, which is a bacterium. Insecticidal soaps can work really good, but you have to be careful that they're made for that purpose and they won't, they won't um, you have to test them they, so they don't burn the plant, which means they're just too strong for the plants and cause phytotoxicity. Um, I don't know about iron phosphate for bug or uh, for slugs. There's different baits these days. Kaolin is a clay that interfere, interfere, interferes with um, the insect's ability to even recognize the host. I know they use that in, in apple orchards sometimes. Pyrethrin, we use, we use that in a lot of sprays. It's a knockdown spray, and that's derived from chrysanthemum. It's in most of our mosquito sprays that we use around the house too. And they've got some products for the garden. And of course, all different kinds of sulfur. Sulfur goes way back to the old days of using uh, 
using chemicals that were, and back then they didn't think about, they just didn't have any man-made type chemicals. They were just using things that they could find and sulfur seemed to do pretty good and it still does pretty good. The downside with coppers and sulfur is a lot of often you have to use them over and over again. And copper, for instance, can build up in the soil. It could be somewhat of a uh, problem. Here's some of the UT publications that are pertaining to organic or sustainable. Sustainable is another term that has come along in the recent, maybe last 10 years. I don't think it substitutes for organic, but it kind of goes along with it. They're probably leaning a little bit more of using some non-organic controls, but still you're trying to keep a sustainable crop so that you don't uh, harm the environment. A lot of them are being, per, being made by the folks at the UT Organic Farm. I think that's at least, maybe it's about 20 years old. It's up near, it's just south of campus. If you've ever been there, um, you should go. I don't know if they'll have field days. I think they have virtual field days this year, last year, or maybe this year. But it's neat to see it in person or even if they'll show some really good pictures. And I think it was a farm given to university and for the last 15 or 20 years, they've been just doing all kinds of trials on different organic things that they can do. I think this is a picture of one of their houses. There's the site for Tennessee. I think if you just typed in UT Tennessee Organics, you'd get it. You wouldn't have to even remember this site. But that's the way I usually find things these days. Go to Google and just type in University of Tennessee or just UT Tennessee Organic, and you'll probably get pretty close. And they've got a lot of different publications. This guy here, <laughs> just to finish up, he said, I'll try something new. And he's He's going to get a hold of giraffe manure. <laughs> so I want to thank you for tuning in or listening to this, or maybe you'll see the, the video down the road. Hope it'll, it's more of a general talk, but I think we covered some specifics with diseases. That's my background, diseases more than insects. But I know when you're, it's a challenging situation to, uh, to be a grower and tackle what I've found is that you come across, you're doing real good the first year or two because you've, you're growing on ground that probably was pest free to begin with. Once you grow that crop in any big area and you grow many, many plants, what you end up doing is concentrating those pests in that one area. So down the road, two, three, four, and five years goes on and then then the pests start building up. So it's good to get on them right away. It's good to have those cover crops. It's good to have a row of um, the different dill and different parsley around the edge. You may not even harvest that. You may just pick it off for garnish around your own house. Maybe you can use it as a, a second you know, crop, cash crop. But, um, but those, those little areas are so beneficial. I've been reading some of the trade magazines and even some of the big growers are doing that kind of thing. They take the time to maybe plant a whole big row down the center of their property and grow something that's gonna not, oh, the only reason it's there is just to provide a nice harbor for some of these beneficial insects that'll help you out down the road. Awesome, thank, thank you so much, Tom. Tom, thank you once again for giving us your time as well as your expertise on this topic. Uh, it is much appreciated. My pleasure. Um, yeah, thank you, and uh, we'll catch you later. Very good, thanks, Steph.